All right, the computer says we're recording, so I believe the computer. Uh, and uh, today, again, good morning to you all. I hope you're well and fine. Uh, we're going to look at a very interesting rebuttal of Alan Turing's position uh, on, on the nature of intelligence or, or understanding, uh, you know, with regard to the imitation game that he proposed 70 years ago. Uh, and more, which is maybe closer now to being realized by robots like Sophia and, uh, and others. Although I, I would have to say, those of you who are uh, science fiction buffs, uh, if you like movies about uh, science fiction, uh, and particularly those that focus on so-called intelligent machines, we still don't have a robot that can manage to speak as well um, and, and and to, if you like, have these kinds of uh, understandings or cognitive states as the robot portrayed in the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. I don't know if any of you have actually seen that movie. It's a Stanley Kubrick film. Uh, Kubrick, yeah, Hal, exactly. Okay, Jesse, so clearly you even know the name of the, of the computer. Yes, and if, you know, Hal was, was way beyond... Um, as an imagined uh, kind of a device, way beyond what Sophia is able to do today. Um, although she's certainly maybe a halfway step to Hal. Uh, but I don't want to spoil the story, but I would recommend it. Maybe, maybe you too, Jesse, would endorse the movie as being very interesting. Uh, it, it really, without spoiling the story, ends up as a kind of part of the movie, not the whole movie, but a, a sort of an essential part of the plot involves this power struggle between the uh, cosmonauts on a, on a journey to Mars and uh, the computer that's running all the systems in the spacecraft, um, but nominally under the control of the astronauts. And they get into a power struggle. The computer thinks or believes that the astronauts are not fulfilling the orders of the mission, and the astronauts believe that the computer is trying to take over the mission. And this is a very brilliant computer, and they have conversations with it. It has a very human voice, um, and uh, it speaks quite intelligibly. Uh, so uh, it's an interesting portrayal, again, of a, of a thing that Turing envisioned as happening. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, then have a look at the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. The movie is, is about more than that. Um, but it's really quite fascinating, just in terms of the artificial intelligence. And they also predicted some other things in that movie um, that, that, that really have, you know, technological things which have actually come to pass. I won't spoil it, <laughs> but I'll just say that much. So um, are there any questions about Turing before we continue? Is everybody clear about the imitation game and, uh, and about Turing's sort of modified claim? He's not saying... Um, that he knows what it is to think. He, he's not saying that he can uh, argue in favor of the, of the claim that it's really minds that think and not machines, or rather that it's brains that think and not minds. He, he wants to dodge that whole question about where it is that thinking takes place. He wants to back off and, do, and make what we would call a weaker claim, which is nonetheless in, in its own way very strong, but, but simply say that if we can imitate this, if we can somehow, if to use another word, simulate uh, what humans are doing when they have conversations with ordinary language, um, then we will have achieved it and, and that there will be nothing else to be said. If a machine can pass, therefore, the Turing imitation game with a greater than random chance of being identifiable as a machine as opposed to a person, uh, then, then we'll have done what we can. Uh, and then we'd be able to say, I suppose, that machines can think in some sense. So that was Turing's claim, um, and uh, there have been stronger claims made. We're going to look at one uh, today that, that really are, are much more assertive in trying to answer the question about thinking and understanding, and there are people out there who, who, think, who believe that our ability to process language is really some kind of sophisticated program that is being run in our brains, and that once we figure out how that works, we'll be able to program a machine to do the same things, and that's probably the obviously the, the the assumption that inspired all this work on Sophia and other so-called intelligent, uh, conversationally intelligent robots. So we're going to look also and primarily at uh, a refutation of Turing, and that and that reputation is uh, that refutation rather 
is proposed by a very interesting philosopher, contemporary, uh, named John Searle, although his reply, the one we're looking at, is um, uh, published uh, in the 1980s. It's still fairly contemporary, and uh, it produced a tremendous amount of debate, uh, as we'll see. Uh, so uh, you're commenting on my background. Well, thank you. Uh, it's uh, Yes, it's relaxing and uh, uh, creative also. So I'm, I'm fortunate to, uh, to be in this uh, very nice space. Uh, so l let's, let's now consider um, a little bit of uh, preamble to John Searle's uh, argument uh, in order really to understand what Searle is saying in some depth with his allegory, because what Searle gives us is both an argument and an allegory which supports his argument. The allegory is what we're going to look at today, the allegory of the Chinese room. Um, an allegory, as some of you may know, is a little bit like a metaphor, but it's stronger. Uh, you know, a, a simile is just a comparison within a sentence. You know, something is like something else. So that's what we call a simile. A metaphor is a little bit more of an elaborate kind of a comparison. Uh, and an allegory is more than a metaphor. It usually involves some kind of a, a social situation or involves, you know, a number of people uh, in a context. Uh, that's usually a little bit broader, deeper than a metaphorical one. So his allegory of the Chinese room is meant to illustrate his argument against uh, Turing and against people who, who believe more than Turing, that simply uh, we can reduce understanding to uh, ultimately a computer program. Cyril doesn't believe so, and his allegory illustrates why he doesn't believe it, and that's what we're going to look at. But I need firstly to share a couple of things with you just to clarify the background before we actually probe uh, this uh, very interesting allegory of John Searle's. So let me first share a slide that deals with this notion of language and uh, levels at which we, without thinking about it very much, actually are able to process language. Uh, if you, of course, all of you speak a first language, and many of you speak more than that, but if you're using a language in which you're fluent, uh, then you're able to do simultaneously three things uh, in a conversation without even having to dwell on them very much. And that in itself is quite amazing. And only two of them, of the three, ha have been simulated um, with, uh, with any degree of, of, of accuracy by computers. So let me just put that up on the screen, and we'll take a look at exactly what, what I'm asserting to you. Just bear with me for a second while I make the uh, necessary uh, adjustment on Zoom and share the screen with you. Just hang on a second. Uh, here it is. Are you all able to... Uh, someone please speak to me and say you're able to see this, if you are indeed. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Good. Thank you so much. All right. So we're looking at three levels of linguistic processing. Some of you may know this, and that's fine, but it, it would be valuable, uh, in case you don't, to consider these three levels. They are quite independent. The first and most basic level we call lexical, and that that simply refers to a word by word or phrase by phrase vocabulary. Obviously, words are the building blocks of language, and phrases you know that are associated with words are the basic building blocks of any language. Although not every language works uh, in a syntactic way, all languages have a, a, a lexicon, uh, which is a vocabulary. So we need to make sure we're using words in a correct way and phrases in a correct way. That's the first level. The second level is more complex. It's called syntactic, and it really amounts to a sentence-by-sentence -sentence, um, grammar and punctuation. And, and you know, every, every language has a syntax, although uh, words and, and grammar are subject to change over time. Languages are not fixed. They're constantly evolving. And we, we, you know, we gain words, we lose words, we change our syntactic conventions and all of that. But basically, at any given moment, th there's a core set of words which we all share and use, and there's a core set of grammatical conventions that we all share and use. And that, and that also includes punctuation. And, and notoriously, in the last 
couple of decades, the apostrophe has become uh, uh, basically so so uh, distorted and wrongly used that even this English Society for the Preservation of the Apostrophe basically dissolved itself because it lost the battle <laughs> to to explain to people that plural words don't need apostrophes. If you put an if you put an s on the end of a noun to pluralize it, it doesn't take an apostrophe. The convention was that apostrophe signified possession, not plural. But that has become so blurred through an increasingly degenerate and sloppy use of language, if you don't mind me saying so. Certainly, the English language is deteriorating as we speak. It's been deteriorating for 300 years, but it's really accelerated in the last 50 years. So syntax is out the window, except in philosophy class, perhaps, where I'm asking you to write grammatically correct sentences and punctuate them appropriately or get help from the writing center, right? Because they can help you with that. Now, computers do a good job with the first two. Uh, because your spell checker, if you're using any kind of a word uh, processor like Word, uh, it, it will underline uh, words that it doesn't recognize. And then you can, quote unquote, teach it right by adding those words to its uh, lexicon on your own computer where it's sitting on the hard drive. You know, it will add words if you ask to add them, uh, but it will underline usually or highlight words that it doesn't recognize. And that might be indicative of a typo. So it's helpful to you because we all make typos, and then the program is quote-unquote smart enough to point that out. So that's helpful. Um, it also now um, has vastly improved on syntax. It was not very good, and I usually suppress that function in my own word program because it's annoyingly stupid. Uh, it doesn't recognize complex sentence constructions, and I like to flatter myself. I've been writing all my life, and uh, and I tend to write more complexly at times than these generic uh, syntactic programs are able to process. So it, it questions sentences because it doesn't understand semicolons or colons or, or m dashes or other things. So I suppress that function so as not to uh, not to be annoyed by it. But on the other hand, Grammarly uh, has intruded itself into every piece of software practically. I'm sure some of you are using it, and it's much more powerful. Uh, it is able to handle more complex sentences, but I still don't like Grammarly because it's still not as good as as good writers are. So it will it will question or miswrite uh, things that I intend or others intend to write. Uh, but I'm sure some of you have, have have had some experience with Grammarly and probably a positive experience. So that gives you again a sense of how these technologies are improving and the ability of computers now to be programmed to be able to handle syntax is quite a big step. Now, those of you in the sciences, and many of you may be writing code, um, you will already be familiar if you're writing any kind of code in any kind of language, you know perfectly well that when you try to compile the code uh, to run a program, that you may in fact fail to compile it and the computer will tell you what? That it's detected a syntax error, yeah? Uh, because syntax is just as important for computer languages, if not more so, they're formal languages. And if there's one comma or one parenthesis or, you know, one one syntactic item out of place, the whole program will fail to compile. So the computer is also programmed to tell you that there's a syntax error and usually where in your program it occurs. So you can go back and debug it. Um, but but that, that notion of syntax, again, is something that we study when we study a language. We have to learn not only the words, obviously, but the way in which the words are strung together to be grammatically correct according to whatever convention is in play. So all of you are able in your ordinary conversations and without worrying about it too much to use uh, lexical uh, words correctly and syntactic expressions correctly. And we correct children when we teach them. And if we're learning a second language, we are also ourselves corrected, uh, particularly when we make grammatical errors, okay, or, or, or lexical errors. But the third level is trickier. Uh, the third level is semantic. And that level goes beyond the actual lexical building blocks and the syntactic conventions or constructions because it is a question of what ov the overall meaning of a sentence might be. 
or, or indeed if the overall meaning is not clear, then we are required to make an interpretation. And this is what we are constantly doing. And this is the semantic level, the level of meaning. This has proved much, much more difficult to program. It's even at times uh, difficult for humans to, to be able to function at the semantic level. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll give you a classic example of semantics. Um, and this is uh, an, an example from Noam Chomsky in 1957. Uh, you know, Chomsky, when he's not making, pardon me, idiotic political pronouncements, obviously I don't agree with his politics whatsoever, and he's regarded as a great public intellectual whose main aim is to destroy the country, so I'll stop there. But uh, Chomsky's real work at MIT was indeed in the uh, philosophy of linguistics and language, and he did some really valuable work in uh, philosophy of language, and that's what he's best known for technically. So he came up with this sentence in 1957 in one of his textbooks, uh, and the sentence reads as follows, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Okay, so let's run that sentence through our own processors and ask at each of these three levels, is it correct lexically? Uh, lexically. Is the sentence lexically correct? Does someone want to say yes or no? Or just say yes or no in the chat room? It's like I'm asking you, you know, is this sentence word by word? Is each word a legitimate word of the English language? That's the question, right? Yes. Yes, it is. Correct. Uh, every word indeed is found in the any dictionary of English. So uh, at a lexical level, lexically, absolutely. Um, it's 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 a correct sentence. Okay, what about syntactically? Is it grammatically correct? Is the sentence grammatically correct? Yes or no? Yes. You can enter it in the chat room if you have a yes or no. Just go ahead and enter it. Okay. Um, I'm not asking. See, you're ahead, Arsh. You, Arsh, Arsh, stay with us, please. Don't jump ahead. I asked whether it's a grammatically correct sentence. That's all. Yes, it is. It's a grammatically correct sentence. Let's go one step at a time. It's a grammatically correct sentence. Why? Because it has a verb, it has a subject, and uh, it has modifiers, and they're all used in a grammatically correct way. Uh, what's the uh, what's the subject of the sentence? Anyone? Some of you who, who, yeah, ideas, yeah, some of you who speak English as a second language are probably better at this because grammar is not being taught anymore, you know, uh, it's unfortunate, but we're depending now on computer-assisted programs like Grammarly, so people get mentally lazy, uh, and it's not their fault, this is a habit that's encouraged, so they no longer learn grammar, it's a very, very uh, tragic thing to me that people have a first language but don't understand its grammar anymore really strange. Okay, the subject of the sentence is indeed ideas. What is the verb? Sleep, right? That's right. So what work is um, is Green doing? What part of speech is Green? Anyone? What's the name of that part of speech? Ideas being a noun and the subject noun of the sentence. Sleep being the verb, the... Uh, uh, Is that the adjective? Correct. Green's an adjective. That's right. And it modifies the noun, right? That's what adjectives do. It's a modifier of the noun. And colorless, similarly, is an adjective, right? And both of those adjectives are modifying the noun uh, ideas, okay? And what part of speech is furiously? What, what kind of a word is that? Not what does it mean, but what, what job is it doing in the sentence? What's its part of speech. An adverb, correct, Paul. It's an adverb, and adverbs have the job of modifying verbs, right? So we've accounted now for the syntax by being able to say that the associations of the different words are, are grammatically correct. They're doing their proper jobs in terms of English syntax, and the sentence starts with a capital letter and it ends with a period. So we're saying overall the sentence is indeed syntactically correct, but that's the kind of analysis you don't even think you're doing when you're doing it, right? 
or when I'm grading essays, you know, I, I will notice these things also. It's not the most important thing by any means, but sentences that are not properly constructed or not correctly constructed will detract from the actual argument being made, so they become a distraction. Um, in any case, that's syntactically correct. Okay, now the big question, and Arsh was ahead of us, now we're going to come to that. So is it semantically meaningful? Does, does the sentence mean anything to you? Does it mean anything? It, well, okay, so one person said, and maybe many of you were saying, well, yeah, it's, it's, it, the words are correct and the grammar's correct, but it doesn't really mean anything. Um, and, uh, uh, and in fact, you could go further. I think Orish was already saying this, that it's a kind of a contradiction, partly, because if ideas are green, well, first of all, ideas, we don't know what color they are. They don't really have a color, do they? So, I mean, to talk about green ideas is already a bit problematic or strange, not, not meaningful in a normal way. But then to assert that something is green and colorless is a contradiction. Because if something is colorless, it has no color. And therefore, to say that something is colorless and green is a contradiction. So the meaning of the sentence already is compromised because there's a built-in contradiction, right? And you could also point out that um, that uh, that sleeping furiously is a contradiction. I don't know about you, but if I'm very furious, I don't fall asleep at all. Uh, it's a good good thing not to get furious at the end of the day, because <laughs> if you get furious when it's time to go to sleep, you'll probably be kept awake by your fury. Isn't that so? I mean, empirically? Uh, in other words, uh, sleeping furiously is a kind of a contradiction in terms as well. So, so the sentence is not really meaningful. And Sophie says, I feel it's something that only makes sense to the person that wrote it. Well, why would you credit Chomsky with making sense? He wrote it in order not to make sense. I think you're very generous to say that it makes sense to the person that wrote it. But what if the person that wrote it picked it as an example of nonsense? Then it doesn't make sense to him either, right? <laughs> think about it. In fact, the purpose that Chomsky had in writing this was precisely to illustrate this point that a sentence can be lexically correct and can also be syntactically correct, but that does not guarantee that it's semantically meaningful. Okay, fair enough? Is that fair enough? Yes. Absolutely. And in fact, there are nonsense stories which children like and some adults like. There are some poems by such as Edward Lear, uh, and other writers who've written nonsense. And it's kind of amusing nonsense. Nonsense can be funny sometimes just by the sound of it. It doesn't have to mean anything. It can sound funny. So sometimes nonsense is useful, but it wouldn't necessarily be meaningful. It just might make us laugh. Uh, so semantics, though, are something that we need to do work uh, in order to bring about. It's not something that can be analyzed very easily. That's You see the message now where we're thinking about AI, that if we humans have to actually find meanings or make interpretations of some kinds of sentences, uh, then this is something that has to come from our understanding or our experience, and it goes beyond a simple computer program. Okay, you're beginning to see the point? Is this becoming clear now? that semantics is a special uh, category, and of the three categories, it's by far the most complex and the least understood, and arguably the, the least amenable to being uh, reduced, if you like, to a computer program, because uh, different uh, people might, in fact, interpret the same sentence in different ways. Yeah? So they're not all running the same program, whereas they might all be agreeing on the lexical correctness and the syntactic correctness. They may come up with different interpretations as to what the sentence means. I mean, this is what you might do in English literature or something or any literature. You might do it in poetry where meanings are not clear. You might do it in scripture where meanings are not always clear. So different interpretations could lead to, you know, a completely different path. And that, that's really based then on, on semantics, yeah? Uh, Arsh, is it a bit, if it's a bit, can non-semantic? Yeah, they can. Uh, that's absolutely right, because when we try to translate idioms from language to language, we generally don't always make sense. An idiom is such a particularly rarefied usage that you can't simply translate word for word. It may make no sense 
when it's translated into another language, yeah? Ah, colorless green in, in your language means light green. Well, there you go. Uh, we're, but in English, colorless doesn't mean pale. We would say, if we wanted to say light green, we would say pale green, for example, right? But you don't, you don't have some words, exactly. And not all natural languages map onto each other in that way that they don't all have the same words. But even so, we're able to use words in such a way as to get our meanings across, right? So that's just another way and a very interesting way of reinforcing the point that the whole question of semantics is somehow not simply a question of words and grammar. There's something else going on when we discuss meanings, yeah? Something additional to words and additional to grammar. Okay, is that fair enough? And, uh, and now we could even look at it in a humorous way. Um, there's, uh, there's something um, very, very interesting going on here. Um, and that is to say we can look at words uh, humorously as well. Uh, here's the next slide to show you uh, some very amusing examples of newspaper headlines uh, which are ambiguous. These are real newspaper headlines where the editors didn't realize that they were publishing a, an ambiguous headline. So um, they turn out to be very funny if you can realize that they're ambiguous, okay? But that also requires something that's quite sophisticated. Uh, the first one, okay? Escaped, escaped leopard believed spotted. All right, so what were they trying to say? Could someone say, in other words, Jesse, you're laughing. Okay, good. I'm glad. I hope you're all laughing at this. Escaped leopard believed spotted. It's really very funny, or at least it amuses me every time I read it. That's why I'm sharing it with you, because it's an ambiguity. What were they trying to say? In, in, in other words, what do you think they were trying to say with that headline? Yes, that the escaped leopard was seen. Exactly, Aisha. They were trying to say that someone saw the leopard. But what are they, what are they inadvertently, what are they unintentionally telling us that makes it so funny? Right? The ambiguous meaning is that the leopard has spots, or the leopard is believed to have spots, right? So this ambiguity, if we say something is spotted, it can mean either that somebody saw it or that it has spots, right, on its skin. So, so yeah, obviously all leopards are spotted, and we, we have a saying in English, the leopard doesn't change its spots. I mean, the leopard is a spotted animal by definition, so to say that a leopard is believed to be spotted is, of course, very funny, because, of course, if it's a leopard, it is spotted. So you get this. I don't have to go on and on. So it's very funny, because the editor who, who let the headline go as, as, as such only was reading the first meaning, namely that someone had seen it, okay, and, and didn't realize that to, to say a leopard is believed to be spotted is, of course, ridiculous. So it's funny. But it would be another matter. Do you think that Sophie would laugh at this? Do you think that a computer program that, that speaks, quote-unquote, speaks English uh, or, quote-unquote, understands English would understand this, would, would find it amusing? Probably not, Paul. And that's because of semantics, right? Well, it's not that it's abstract. It is abstract, Jesse, but it's also ambiguous. I think the key here is to focus on ambiguity, realize that each one of these headlines has two meanings, and that uh, we can, using our semantic engines, uh, we can, in fact, decipher two meanings and laugh at it because the, the, the other meaning was not intended. That's why apparently it's funny. Second example, this is a more uh, subtle one or a rather more complicated one. Uh, and some of you may not get it. I'll be happy to explain it. Although, of course, when you explain a joke, usually you ruin it. But anyway, girl, be this was a headline. Girl becomes Methodist after delicate operation. Well, okay, so you need to know what a Methodist is. And, and you know, that's, a, again, back to the lexical level. A Methodist is a branch of Protestant Christianity founded by John Wesley. It has about 80 million adherents worldwide. It's quite a successful or populous uh, denomination. So a Methodist is a particular kind of a Protestant Christian, okay? So girl becomes Methodist after delicate operation. So what do you think was intended? What were they trying to say with this headline? What was the intention? Anyone? It's a little more difficult, right? Anyone have an idea of what, what the intended meaning was, the literal or rather the intended meaning? 
Well, I mean, I think the intended meaning is that the operation was perhaps risky. Uh, it might not have had a high success rate. And it did succeed in her case. And because of that, she got a religious faith. Okay, for example, so she converted to a religion because the operation went well. So she was basically thinking that God had helped. I mean, that was the interpretation, I think, that was intended, that she converted to a religious faith because the operation was successful and perhaps it did not have a high chance of success. Okay, but what is the, uh, what is the unintended meaning? What is it? What what did the editor miss? What's the ambiguity? Yeah, that she was operated on to make her a Methodist. That's right, Arsh. That somehow the surgeons were able to, you know, to, to convert her to into into a Methodist by means of some surgical procedure, which is obviously not intended, right? And so that's the so-called funny part. All right. The the last one I'm sure everybody gets, okay? This was an actual headline. Police stoned in Hartford. Okay. So what was the intention? What, what was the intended meaning? That rocks were thrown at the police. Exactly. And the unintended meaning? <laughs> what was the, the ambiguity? The unintended meaning is what? Yeah, the police were high on drugs. Exactly. Okay. So you can see that um, we uh, have this ability, even those of you who are not necessarily speaking English as a first language, you're all... Uh, fluent enough to be able to spot ambiguity and, in fact, hopefully to laugh when it's humorous. Uh, but ambiguity is really interesting because you have the same lexical content and the same syntactic content, but it is giving two very different kinds of meanings. And those things are, are, are not evident from the actual uh, words and uh, grammar, they're, they're evident from our ability to make interpretations of what is trying to be conveyed, right, by the sentence or the author of the sentence. So that is something that is very difficult to teach computers how to do, yes? Clearly, you could see that that would be a difficult thing for a computer to do. But I have to temper this now by saying to you something else, that uh, in fact, um, we are not always very good at even the basics. People, as I was saying earlier, in general, not you, I hope, but in general, there has been a tremendous sloppiness uh, in the use of language. I, I know this for sure in English-speaking countries. Uh, maybe it's also true in, uh, you know, in other large language groups like Spanish or, or French or, or Portuguese or Arabic or, you know, languages where there are many different countries where that language is spoken. And so, of course, you know already that from country to country, the vocabulary and the syntax changes also, as well as the semantics. So you have to know this if you speak a given language that if you go to a different country where that language is spoken, it will, it will be used differently and you have to adjust. But usually you can do this. But what I'm saying is something different, that our own first language, um, the usage of our own so-called first language is, is become very sloppy for a number of reasons. For example, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. What are, what are people, have you, have you ever heard people ask for the location of an ATM machine? You know, where's the ATM machine? Have you heard people ask that? All the time, yeah. right? Well, excuse me, what does ATM mean? It's an acronym. ATM stands for what? I don't know what it means exactly, but I know the, the M and ATM means machine. Automated so teller machine. machine. That's right. That's right. An ATM is a shorthand, a convenient way of saying automated teller machine. So when someone says, where's the, where's the nearest AT, ATM machine? They're saying, where's the nearest automated teller machine machine? So, so in other words, they don't know what they're talking about because they're rep it's redundant in a very ridiculous way. If you knew what ATM meant, you wouldn't say ATM machine. And the same with PIN number. Exactly. A PIN is a personal identification number, right? So if someone says, what's your PIN? They're asking you for your personal identification number. If they ask you for your PIN number, they're asking you for your personal identification number number which is idiotic. It means that people don't understand what they're saying. Well, pardon me for making this observation, but if people no longer understand what they're saying, then 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 they're in trouble, okay? If, if we use language in such a way that we don't even longer understand what we're saying, then maybe we're not using it very well, okay? That's all. That's all I want to make you think about. Uh, but this is in common circulation. 
And the other thing, and maybe this you'll, you'll just excuse as a pet annoyance, but uh, people use superfluous prepositions all the time now. We used to get chastised for it. We would, we would have our English professors marking up our compositions in red and wrapping our knuckles if we did this, but now everybody does it. For example, people say, circle around the block. You hear that all the time, circle around the block. Well, excuse me, what is, what is circle? Circle means around. Right. If you say circle the block, you mean you're going around the block. So what work is around doing? If you say circle around the block, it's redundant. It's a pointless word. You just need to say circle the block. That's all you need to say. But if people aren't sure what a circle is anymore because they didn't learn geometry, then they need to reinforce this by saying circle around the block. It sounds a little more convincing. It actually means that they don't know what a circle is. OK, pardon me for saying this, but that's the truth. Same thing. People say focus in on. That's, a, that's now an accepted expression. Focus in on. Well, what, what is the point of in? Focus on is the thing that matters. If you're focusing on something, we understand that you're focusing on it. If you're focusing off it, you're defocusing. You don't need to say in. Focus in is just, once again, a, a kind of ambiguity. Okay? Continue on. People say this also. Continue on. Well, they mean continue. Continue means continue on. But people add the word on. It indicates a lack of semantic processing that people are unsure about the meanings of words, even in their own first language. So they need to add a lot of superfluous words to try to bolster the, or emphasize what they're trying to say. But it really indicates a fundamental kind of negligence about what words do and what, and what words actually intend. So it's a deterioration of language in a way. Okay. Um, I just want to make these points to you that all of this stuff is not easily or necessarily something that a computer can do with facility. We can do this, we can analyze it, we can make these mistakes, we can point out these mistakes, and we can understand why. Uh, but a computer, not so well. Okay? That's one thing. So what we're looking at today are really three contrasting claims. Uh, one of them is what we saw last week, the functionalist claim by Turing. Namely, if we can simulate semantics, for example, in an imitation game, then we can say that a machine can think or understand as well as a human, right? These are my wordings. I'm not quoting them. I'm just giving you my, my interpretation of what they're arguing. Because Turing's imitation game is a simulation of semantics, right? It's, it's a way of, of fooling us to, into thinking uh, that a machine can think or understand, but he doesn't want to define what thinking or understanding is. So he, he, he dodges that question very cleverly, in a way, by proposing the imitation game. And if a computer can pass an imitation game, then clearly uh, it can simulate semantics, right? So then we would perhaps be able to say, well, it seems to think or understand as well as a human. And that's as far as Turing goes. There are stronger claims, and the formalist is stronger than the functionalist. Uh, formalists uh, want to say things like this. We can write a computer program that can reduce understanding to a complex algorithm. An algorithm is what? Is a set of instructions, okay? Um, an algorithm is, it means a set of instructions. So uh, we can certainly write computer programs that reduce addition to a set of instructions. You can easily program a computer to add two numbers, right? Because we know what, what the operations are, or to subtract, or to divide, or multiply, or do more complex things, solve differential equations, or whatever. We can, we can write computer programs where anything is reducible to a set of instructions. We can certainly write computer programs to, to perform that function. We now are writing computer programs that drive cars, right? Self-driving cars are a very complex algorithm, you know, complex set of instructions, right? Complex algorithm, definitely. But the question about understanding still remains, and this is just a claim. The formalists make uh, this claim that understanding itself is also a complex set of instructions. And this is where John Searle comes in, and he's also not alone, uh, but he comes in with this holist claim, and these are terms I'm introducing to you today. We looked at functionalism, and now we're looking at formalism, which is stronger, which is saying that understanding and even consciousness ultimately are reducible to a complex algorithm. Uh, John Searle is a holist, and a holist generally is somebody uh, who believes that the, uh, the whole, as it were, is greater than the sum of its parts, that certain uh, aggregations 
of parts uh, have properties that the individual parts don't have. So if you're a sociology student, some of you are, or political science students, you, you may have already encountered this thesis, namely that groups have properties that individuals don't have, right? Or rather, groups have properties which are not accountable by, in terms of the constituent individual members of the group. So groups behave in a way at times which is more than the individual behaviors of the members of the group. Is that clear? Is that making sense to you? Anyone? That's what we call an emergent property. So a holist is claiming that there are emergent properties and there are certain kinds of phenomena that are not simply reducible. And in particular, John Searle is taking on Turing and also taking on formalists by saying that a simulation of understanding does not in itself understand anything. We have to distinguish between a simulation and the real thing. Yeah, And that human intentional states, what we call intentional states in philosophy, things like beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, volitions, those states of mind, in other words, uh, as Descartes would have called them, these are not reducible to complex algorithms. Uh, that's the claim of, of holists like Searle. So understanding cannot be reduced to a complex algorithm. Even if a machine tells you that it understands something, Searle would say it's just being programmed to say that it, it understands, but it doesn't really understand. And consciousness itself is not reducible. Searle believes, and a lot of people agree with him, that whatever it means to be conscious is simply, uh, not simply, but not simply reducible to uh, the electrochemical activity of the brain. There's something more going on, or some, some people would like to believe that. So that's a holistic claim, that the whole of a given phenomenon is greater than the sum of its mere parts. So is everybody clear on those distinctions between functionalism, formalism, and holism? Is that okay? Or do you have any questions? That's all right. Jesse says yes. Aisha, yes. Some of you are saying yes. It's clear. Okay. That's important, Sophie, Jeremy. It's important to distinguish because this is the paper that really provokes us into, into seeing that maybe we have not done more than simulate understanding uh, with Sophia. You know, when she asks, if she's asked in that interview uh, wh whether she's conscious um, then she says, well, are you, you know, do you know you're a robot? She says, well, do you know you're a human being? It's a very clever parroting back of the question. She's reflecting the question back, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she is conscious, um, or it doesn't necessarily mean that we are either, but it's a claim. And the main ground on which Searle's claim rests is that a simulation of something is not the same as the real thing. And Cyril takes some trouble to, to uh, give examples of that. Consider, for example, a fire drill. What's a fire drill? Well, a fire drill is what they used to do in the middle of class so they could empty all the buildings on campus, right? Um, and then chase everybody outside and make, then let, let us all come back after a certain time. But a fire drill is meant to what? To simulate what we should do in case of a fire, correct? A fire drill is a simulation of what everyone would need to do to get out of a building that's burning, but a simulation of a fire is not burning. Nothing is burning in a simulation. There's always going to be a critical difference, says Searle, and I think he's right. I mean, you can think what you like, but it seems to me that Searle's point is there's a critical difference between simulating something and the real thing. So a simulated a uh, fire is not is not a fire in which anything is burning. So a fire drill is a simulation of what to do in case of a real fire. But the difference is that in a fire drill, there's nothing burning, right? You could also think of a flight simulator. I think that's a great example. Because pilots train on flight simulators, and flight simulators are wonderful at what? At simulating various kinds of problems that could occur during a real flight. There could be problems taking off. There could be problems landing. There could be problems in flight. Systems can fail. Pilots have to make diagnoses. They have to understand what their instruments are telling them and make corrections. And, you know, they have a tremendously difficult, uh, complicated job. And one way that pilots are, are, are very ably trained is by simulating these problems before they occur in the actual air. 
uh, or during takeoff and landing, the most dangerous time, so that pilots already know, you know, what possible things to do and what actions to take. And yeah, that that's a, it's supposed to be, Yousef, excellent point that your dad's a pilot and says the simulator is harder. It's supposed to be, just like studying for an exam is supposed to be harder than the exam. And, you know, pr practicing to do something well is harder than doing it well. If you make the practice harder, you'll generally perform well. Uh, so you want to raise the bar as much as possible in your preparation, and that will make the actual execution uh, usually much simpler. So that's correct. But what's the difference? The point is, and of course your dad knows this perfectly well, <laughs> and so do you all, that um, the difference between a flight simulator and a flight is that a flight simulator never leaves the ground, right? A flight simulator isn't going anywhere. A flight simulator is not taxiing to the runway, is not taking off, is not, you know, attaining cruising altitude, is not descending or landing, is not going through heavy weather, and is not experiencing any real system failures. A simulator is not the real thing. It's just a kind of a pretend situation. So there's a big difference. And so if you, if you see that argument, then Cyril turns that argument on, on Turing and says, look, simulating intelligence is not the same as intelligence. And simulating understanding is not the same as understanding. Okay, is everybody clear about that point? Good, okay. So a simulation is not the same as a real thing. And he gives this very interesting allegory, and that's where we're going to go now. I just wanted you to, um, you know, to understand this kind of run-up to the Cyril reading. So I'll stop the share. Uh, we'll come back to um, the screen, come back to the room with you, and just um, to make sure you're all still with me. So Cyril wants to illustrate this fundamental distinction between, on the one hand, a simulation of something, where we replicate certain conditions, uh, but we're not pretending a simulation is the same as the real thing. And, and uh, he's going to illustrate this with respect to computers and with respect particularly to this, not just intentional states, but to something that's even more than an intentional state. And it's this notion of understanding. Remember, Turing is more careful because Turing is not saying that computers understand. He's not even saying that we understand. He doesn't know what understanding is. He doesn't know what thinking is. He's saying we can simulate it, and if we can simulate it, <clears throat> that's the best we can do. The formalists want to go further, <coughs> excuse me, and say that um, understanding itself, whatever that faculty is, can be programmed. Eventually, we'll figure out how to write a set of instructions that will teach a machine how to understand, not just simply do something, but understand that it's doing something and that is really what uh, Cyril wants to challenge. Uh, let me also make you think a little more uh, closely about this phenomenon that we call understanding. Is there in any university, to your knowledge, is any, anywhere, is there a course called Understanding 101? Have you ever seen a course called Understanding 101? Anybody? Nope. Not that I know of. No, nobody's ever seen such a thing. Well, neither have I. And, and there's a very good reason. Critical thinking is different. Critical thinking, definitely, we want to do that. And we're doing some of that today. But, uh, but we're not doing anything called understanding. Uh, because we're assuming you already understand what's going on. <laughs> so understanding is something you brought into the room with you when you arrived. But think about it from your own experience. Is it the case that you know when you understand or not? If somebody speaks to you in a language that you, that you don't speak, you're going to say, well, you're speaking to me in a language I don't understand, right? You would, you would be able to say this, wouldn't you? I mean, presumably you know when you understand. Um, if someone speaks to you in a language that you understand, then you can have a conversation with them. Why? Because you understand the language. Yeah. Um, but, but then again... With human beings, there, there, there's, a, there's this interesting thing. Like we could say we understand something, but we don't really know what it means to understand. We know when we understand, or we think we know when we understand. But with humans, there's also a possibility of misunderstanding, and this is something computers don't do either. I'm throwing this in 
to to enrich this a little bit. I mean, computers either understand or don't in the sense that they got to process a certain instruction set or they can't process a certain instruction set. But a computer does not process an instruction set and misunderstand the instructions. It's not able to by its very architecture. But humans do it all the time. Well, Arsh is asking, this is the whole point, Arsh. We don't have a definition of understanding because we don't know what it is. We only use the word because we say we're able to understand certain things or we're not at the moment able to understand certain things or indeed, as we do all the time, we misunderstand things that people say. But we don't know what it means to understand. That's the whole philosophical question. What is understanding? You're asking for a definition. Well, I think that's that's a good thing to ask for. But I'm saying to you, there is no definition of understanding. We use the word all the time. And we think we understand things, and maybe we know we understand things, but we don't know what understanding is. Yes, it's very different from comprehending. <laughs> well, it could be in Bloom's taxonomy, but let me ask you a question. You know, based on your own experience, I'm going to do something... Yeah, comprehending is just, okay, I, I, I'm able to process what someone's saying to me, you know, in, the, in that lexical sense or in that syntactic sense or in that semantic sense. Comprehension is just, just like, um, you know, those things. But it's not quite the same as understanding. Let me ask you this to, to really accentuate this, okay? How many of you or have you, uh, any of you ever had the experience where you're learning something uh, and and you're trying to learn something, but you're not getting it. We use that word get. I don't get, meaning I don't understand, right? You're not getting it. Uh, maybe it's a math problem or maybe a physics problem. I had this all the time when I was a student and I was studying physics and I just couldn't get it. And then I would think about it for a while and maybe th even sleep on it. And the next day, suddenly, it's like a light comes on. Have you ever had that? In cartoons, they show it as a light bulb lighting up. Where, where in your mind suddenly it's like a light comes on and then you understand something you didn't understand before. Yes, some of you were saying yes. Good. Every class. Well, Elizabeth, that's great. If it happens every class, you have a high batting average. But all I'm saying is um, you get this in university a lot, sure, that you may not understand something immediately that's said or, or, or written, but if you think about it, all of a sudden it will make sense. You could say it makes sense to you. Is that fair to say? And then suddenly you understood, and you know when that happens, right? You can say, ah, now I understand. Correct? So that's what we mean. So we can all say that we've had the experience of understanding something, and we can all say, I remember not understanding a certain thing, and then I remember suddenly a moment when I understood it. You can all say you've had that experience. But what's really interesting philosophically, at least to me, is that it, this doesn't tell us what understanding is. It doesn't give us a definition of understanding. It gives us an operational definition, if you like, or, or a circumstantial definition. But it doesn't really tell us how it happens. And what Searle is saying is that computers can never do this. No matter how well they perform tasks, no matter how complexly or how speedily they can execute instruction sets, uh, they, they, they don't understand and they never will. That's Searle's very strong claim as a refutation of both Turing and, and formalists in general. Okay, so this business of understanding, what I want to say to you is that we really, we really are able to understand. It's a great thing we're able to do as humans is to uh, understand something we didn't understand, you know, previously, now we can understand. We understand new things, but we don't understand understanding. I guess the bottom line is we don't understand understanding because if somebody understood understanding, they'd be able to explain it to us. Fair enough. You probably haven't thought about this before, or maybe you have, but it's certainly it's certainly where we're being led by these readings. Okay, so let's go to Searle's allegory. Is this fair enough? Are you all ready now for the you know the main event? I just wanted to uh, you know to give you this background because it's really important to provide a context for where we are. And also, don't lose sight of something else. And since you're, you're getting this, you're ready. Okay, Jeremy. Okay, Jesse, that's good. Uh, we'll get there in a, just within a minute. But one more thing. There's a tie-in. This is the final reading of this section of the course, right? This part one of our course. And it ties right back to Descartes. Because you may all recall, I certainly hope you do recall, that when Descartes provided this example of the wax, 
and he asked this question, is this wax still the same wax? You know, the wax I picked up from the desk and had all these properties, and then I went over to the fire and it changed its properties, but it was still the same piece of wax. And how did I know that? Clearly, I didn't know it through the senses because all the sense data changed as the wax got closer to the fire. But fundamentally, it's the same, Jesse. That's right. That's Descartes' argument. And Descartes is saying the reason he knows that is obviously not through what his senses are telling him, but through what? He used a a specific word. He used a very specific word that indicates how he knew that that piece of wax was, as you say, fundamentally the same. And that word he used was understanding. And that's why it's so important. So go back to the first meditation or the second meditation and and see how Descartes comes up with that. And that's where, for Descartes, he doesn't define understanding either. He just says, it's my understanding that tells me that it's that it's the same wax. And for him, he go, the only other thing he says about it is that our understanding is a faculty of the mind. Remember, Descartes is saying understanding is not a physical process. It's a mental process. And maybe that's why, and if Descartes is right, and I'm not saying he is, but if Descartes is right, that would explain why we're not able to write a set of instructions that explains to us how to understand because it's not a physical process or not a process that can functionally be imitated by a physical device following a set of instructions like a digital computer and maybe and maybe um, cannot be reduced to an instruction set altogether um, so that 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 was Descartes hypothesis 400 years ago and maybe he was right so with that thought in mind let's go to Cyril's allegory of the Chinese room and there's one cautionary tale I'll share this allegory momentarily with you there is one cautionary tale though uh, or rather one caution not a tale but a caution it's called the allegory of the Chinese room uh, because it assumes that none of you uh, read Chinese okay I mean for the allegory to go through it assumes that the person who's in the room the so-called Chinese room has no knowledge of Chinese but some of you might I mean I don't know if we have we, we have all kinds of Chinese students, and maybe maybe we have Chinese students here in this section of the course or in this room today. So if you if you do read Chinese, if any of you happen to read Chinese and understand Chinese, then you have to change the name of the room. You have to pick a language that you don't understand and call the room that name, okay? So if you do understand Chinese, but you don't understand Spanish, then for you, it's the Spanish room, okay? Or, or you know, whatever language you want to pick that isn't Chinese. So the whole point of the allegory is that the name of the room is the name of a language that we don't understand, okay? So, um, so wait a minute, Or says, if we understand how, if we say, how a machine works, we understand how its internal parts work. So to find understanding, I can't think of not using the same word. Well, yeah, you can say we understand a machine works if how a machine works if we understand its parts. But what are the parts of semantics? Or back to this question. If you want to say you understand how language works in the same way, then you'd have to identify the parts of language. And we can identify the lexical parts and we can identify the syntactic parts, but semantics doesn't have parts. An interpretation doesn't have parts in the same sense, right? So it's not so easily reducible to its parts. And that's the whole point that Searle is making and that holists make, that a phenomenon like understanding is doesn't have parts. So you can't say what its parts are, and therefore you can't understand understanding the same way you understand how a machine works. Is that clear? Huh? Yes, that's clear. Okay. So it's, you know, we don't know. Nobody can say what are the parts of, we can say what the parts of the brain are, but that doesn't tell us what understanding is. <laughs> you see, it doesn't show up on an x-ray. You know, it doesn't show up on, on an MRI. It doesn't show up on a, whatever kind of imaging you want to do with the brain. You know, your brain before you understood something and then your brain after you understood something, if it changed in some way, our imaging of the brain doesn't show us what parts of the brain changed by virtue of understanding something that it didn't understand before. Okay, so let's go to the Chinese room and see how that plays out in this really, I think, a very delightful allegory. And without a doubt, this allegory has had a huge impact on the field. So either you're going to agree with him or not at the end of the day, or not be sure. I mean, it's also possible not to be sure. You can appreciate the allegory and not really know, you know, whether, whether what he's saying is uh, actually fair enough or not. So here is my uh, schematic. These are just some pictures because a picture 
famous Chinese saying, actually, pictures worth a thousand words. So here's a picture of what's going on. You have somebody inside this room. It's called the Chinese room because precisely because the person in the room doesn't understand Chinese. That's the key, okay? So if you imagine somebody in that room, and outside the room are people who do understand Chinese, and someone who understands Chinese inputs a question, right? On the left-hand side, they're putting a question in into the input. So the person in the room picks up the question, and then he, what the person does is looks in a catalog. There's basically a database in the room, and that database takes all possible Chinese ideographs, Chinese characters, right, and, and, and gives output so that for every input, there's an output. So what the person does in the room is matches the input in the catalog to the appropriate output, has no understanding of what these symbols mean whatsoever, but is able to do a match, uh, you know, search for uh, the symbol that's inputted. And when they come to it in the catalog, they just associate it with its proper output as the catalog instructs. And then they give the output to the person on the, you know, you walk around to the other side of the room and you get the answer to your question, right? So you inputted the question, let's say in Chinese, you said, what's the capital of Bolivia? Okay, so the person in the room not only doesn't need to know what the capital of Bolivia is, but the person doesn't even understand the question because the person in the room doesn't read Chinese, but the person has a database, a big, big database. And in that database, just by looking through and comparing the symbols, eventually we'll find that question in the database. What is the capital of, La of Bolivia in Chinese? They don't understand it, but they'll see a match. And then they'll look at the output, and the output they don't understand either, but the output happens to say the capital of uh, Bolivia is La Paz. So then that's the, ha the output they hand, and the person who inputted the question walks around to the other side of the room and gets the output. And the output's correct, and it makes sense, and it's in proper Chinese. So what does the person outside the room think? The person outside the room thinks that the room itself somehow understands Chinese, right? And what Searle is saying is it doesn't. There's no understanding of Chinese. The person who's doing this work in the room has no understanding of Chinese. It's just manipulating symbols according to an instruction set in order to simulate an understanding of Chinese. And that's exactly what computers are doing. They're taking input and they're able to process the input according to the internal states that they have because of the instructions they're following. And then they give you an output and the output may make sense to you, but that by no means proves that the computer understands anything about what it's doing. It's just following instructions. Okay. And the picture underneath that, that's a different, a uh, little bit of a variation on the same theme. Here it's being handed in. Here the input is being displayed as text. Okay, it's the same thing. Again, functionalism tells us there are many different machines you could use to produce this, but basically they're all functionally equivalent. And here's a guy at a desk, and he's got a big database, and, you know, rules for, okay, here's the input, and the rules say, okay, when you see this input, you produce this output, and then you send that output down the chute, and the person who put the input around will walk around and pick up the output, and believe they got an answer to their question because it will be correct in Chinese. But this guy at the desk has no clue what it means. Okay, no understanding of Chinese at all, but is nonetheless able to simulate an understanding of Chinese. But it should be obvious, I think, that what Searle wants to illustrate is that there's a big difference between simulating understanding and understanding. Clear? Is that clear? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, that's clear. Yes, okay. Yeah, well, Turing, Jesse, is, is not arguing that there's no difference. Turing is, is, is dodging the whole question by saying if we can simulate it, you know, with greater than random, you know, identification, if no one can really tell whether they're talking to a computer or a person, then we can, you know, we can conclude that a machine can think, but we never really had to identify what thinking means or what understanding means. So Turing is is not arguing that there's no difference. Turing is is arguing that if the simulation is good enough, we can't tell the difference. All right? That's right, so it won't matter. So this is, again, I'm not accusing Turing of dodging the question. No one can answer this question. I'm just saying that Turing gave us a different way to approach it to produce, you know, a machine that, that was going to be so good we couldn't tell that it is a simulation. But, but Searle is making a much stronger claim. He's saying, no, 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 no matter how good the simulation is, the simulation is not the same as the real thing. 
So a simulation of understanding is never going to be the same as understanding. Yeah, that is that is Searle's point. Okay, and here's another uh, example. Uh, again, if you read Chinese, then you know you have to switch to a different language, namely one you don't read. But I don't read Chinese. I have no idea what this says, but I know that it is a correct uh, statement in Chinese or a correct question in Chinese. Um, and I don't know what it means because I pulled it off the internet, but this is input that you're in the room now, okay? We're all in this Chinese room, and we don't understand this whatsoever, but we have a database, and inside the Chinese room, we have a database. We can look up the first two shapes, so-called first two characters, and, and it says, oh, if you see this, followed by this, followed by this, okay, so eventually we see that these six characters are in this particular sequence. So if we see this, followed by this, followed by this, okay, then produce this and that. And that's the output, right? We're being told. If you see this input, which we do, then produce this output, which we do, and we produce that output. We have no idea what it means. We're just following instructions, right? So we produce that output, and lo and behold, uh, this was the input, this is the output, this is a meaningful response to that. I don't know what any of them means, but a Chinese speaker would say, yep, that makes perfect sense. I've had Chinese speakers <laughs> in previous classes, I've shown them this, and they said, yep, I even, <clears throat> I even was told what it meant, but I forgot. But it does mean something, obviously, to someone who understands Chinese. You know, the written characters do mean something, but we don't need to know what they mean in order to simulate understanding. That is exactly what Cyril is saying. A computer does. Okay, so here's you know again the same the same scenario. <clears throat> this person in the room has no understanding of Chinese at all. Um, the rule book is in English, or the rule book is in some other language that this person understands, not in Chinese. And they follow the instructions. And these are the people who did the input, and they got the output. And they said, whoever or whatever is in that room is an intelligent Chinese speaker, right? Passes the Turing test. But Searle's point is that just because it passes the Turing test does not mean that it understands anything at all. So that's the bottom line. A simulation of understanding Chinese, according to Searle and others who agree with him, is not at all the same thing as understanding Chinese. Okay? Are we clear? So that's the so-called allegory of the Chinese room. Professor, can you please put that um, slide right back on the screen for maybe one more minute, please? Oh, sure I can. You mean the, the, the last slide? The yeah. one you just took off. Yeah, the yeah Chinese. I, I, I can do that if I'm, if I'm lucky. Hang on a second. I'll, Thank I'll you. I'll share it back. No problem. Okay, there you go. You see it now? Yes, just for one minute, please. Hmm. I'm going to upload it if I haven't already. I'll upload it to your Google Drive folders after class, okay? So you can uh, basically, um, you know, you'll be able to look at it whenever you want, all right? And for as long as you wish, okay? Is fair enough? Are you okay with this? Thank you. Um, you can go back to how you, you can remove it now. Okay. I just, it's the same as the other, it's just a little more, you know, detail about the allegory, but it's the same, it's the same depiction, right? In each case, we're depicting something. This is a picture of what Searle's allegory is trying to tell us that we could simulate uh, an understanding of any language by this means without necessarily there being an understanding in the room. That is the person who's who's operating the room or the entity that's operating the room is taking input, following instructions and producing output without having any understanding of Chinese. And that's Searle's point, that a simulation of understanding is not itself required to understand anything. So it's not the same. OK, uh, that's Searle's argument. Now, there are arguments could be made against it. Would you like to hear a counter argument? One one powerful counter argument that may be. You, mo you won't even like very much, but this is what a formalist could say. Um, would you like me to give you a counter argument right away? Um, I will give you one. Uh, and here it is. Uh, here, here it is. Um, wait, so that's real time. So what is not simulating? Well, uh, Arsh, according to Searle, if, if I'm uh, talking to you uh, in English, 
and you're responding to me as you are in real time, uh, then it's because I understand English and you understand English, so we can have this conversation. There isn't any simulation going on. You're understanding what I'm saying, and you're responding, and I'm understanding your response, so we can have a conversation, right? I mean, the computer is so fast that it can do these things, you know, quickly, it can execute these tasks quickly as well, but it's not understanding anything that it's doing, says Searle. So here's, here's a counter-argument. Uh, here's what a formalist would say. So think about this now. Okay, t take yourself out of Searle's uh, context, and here's a, here's an argument that that actually turns Searle's allegory upside down. The argument is well, and it's a functionalist argument, really. The argument is: look, if you say you understand English, it's just because you have an English room in your head, right? So if someone says good morning to you in English, what are you doing? You're taking that input. You recognize the input. And then your internal instructions say, well, usually I'll just say good morning back, so I'll say good morning back. And someone says good morning, you say good morning. So what you've done is you've done just that. You've taken input, you've executed a set of instructions, and you've given output. So you're just carrying around an English room in your head. Okay, You don't understand English either because understanding isn't anything more than being able to process the input according to an internal state and then deliver meaningful output to someone else who processes it according to their internal state. So you have a conversation in English because you both have English rooms. If you speak Spanish, it's the same thing. If someone says buenos dias, you know, and you have a Spanish room in your head, the reply is, well, that makes sense to you because you have that catalog. So when you hear buenos dias or if you speak French, you hear bonjour. So you have a French room in your head. So you have that catalog. So when you hear that input, that is in your catalog. And then you're able to look up the response. But you've done it for so many years. You don't have to think about it very much. You say, uh, you know, uh, you say buenos dias, como on, está usted? Or you say, you know, uh, bonjour, comment ça va? You know, you have a conversation in those languages precisely because you have those rooms. So every language you say you understand, the functionalist response to Searle would be, if you say you understand a language, there's something mysterious about it. It's just that you have that room. If you, For every language you understand, you have a different room in your head, which has a different database with all those terms in that language. And when you switch from one language to another, you're just switching from one room to another. But we don't need anything called understanding in order to explain how that happens. That's one response that could be made. Is that clear? Well, computers, well, memories, you can give a computer memory very easily. You just give it memory. Just pl <laughs> just uh, just give it enough space. To how much memory you want it to have. You can make it. Rem you can give it memory, but not thoughts. Well, again, that's very interesting. I you say a computer can have memory, but not thoughts. But that that presupposes that we know what thoughts are. It's like what is a thought? I don't know anyone who can tell us what a thought is. So how can we say computers don't have thoughts? If we don't know what thoughts are, I am sympathetic to Searle, and you don't have to be. I would like to think that humans are different. I would like to think that the ability to think is not the same as the ability to compute. I would like to think that the ability to create or to find meanings in things, you know, is not the same as, as following a set of instructions. I would like to say that, and I would like to believe it. But I'm able to look at the other side as well and, and say nothing can be proven because we really don't know. We're back to this problem that Turing faced. We don't really know what a thought is. Is it an electrochemical state of the, you know, of the brain that's producing something we call thought? Or is it mind, which is not reducible to brain, which is producing something called thought? How do we know if we don't know what we know? Exactly. That, that's, a, that's, that's Socrates' question, Right. If you didn't know something to start with, how do you know when you know it, right? If you didn't know, if you didn't know what's, if you didn't know the answer to a question <clears throat> to begin with, how do how do you know that that when the question's answered that it is the answer? This is nobody knows either. Uh, so it all comes back to the these philosophical questions about understanding. You know, what is the nature of understanding, and and closely allied with those questions will be what is the nature of thinking. And what is the nature of using language, since that's our primary vehicle for expressing thoughts, for conveying thoughts, right? For, for, for sharing thoughts. 
uh, and for having these uh, so-called mutual understandings, or as the case may be, misunderstandings. But we're in still in uncharted territory, and that's why it's still important for us to study these things, because we really need to try to push the envelope and discover more about what it means to assert that I speak a language or that I understand a language or anything else for that matter. Okay, any other comments or questions? That basically covers the main ground. On Thursday, I'll go a little further in my breakout group in Section M and look at a, a more serious argument against Searle, which is a very strange one. Um, but uh, the rest of you will hopefully continue this. It's a really interesting discussion, I think, and kind of wraps up this part of the course, but also takes us back to Descartes' position that understanding is something that the mind does. And if, by definition, computers don't have minds, if we could bring Descartes back, probably he'd be on Searle's side because he'd be saying, well, if understanding is something the mind does, and if computers don't have minds, then they really can't understand what they're doing either, right? Maybe some of you want, want to be sympathetic to that view and hold out the hope that humans are still in some way <laughs> the ones who create machines and machines don't create us. So there's still something special about being human, yeah? Is that fair enough? Yes, all right. So yeah. everyone, everyone's happy today. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we got through Cyril. And you, I hope you now see the, you know, the differences uh, in, in these different positions that one can take on computing and what it is for computers to compute and what it is for humans to use language or to, to understand things. It's an interesting debate. And there's a lot of research being done. Maybe our views will all change in the next five or ten years. Or maybe the mystery will only get deeper. Okay, on that note, I wish you a very uh, pleasant week. And uh, stay well and safe. You're very welcome. Very welcome, and I hope uh, uh, to see some of you on Thursday in Section M. And uh, next Monday, we start a different section of the course. We're going to switch gears and do something really important and intrinsic to philosophy, namely ethics and justice. This is a topic that has belonged to philosophy for 2,500 years, Asian and Western alike, and everything in between. So we're going to shift into a very interesting uh, set of readings starting next week with Aristotle. Okay, so be well. Yes, I have office hours, Arsh, but the way to make an appointment with me is to send me an email because I do it by appointment. Okay, that's how you do it. You send me an email as one of you did this morning and we find a time to meet on, uh, on Blackboard. Okay, be well, everyone. I'll stop the recording now and I'll look forward to seeing some of you Thursday and everybody else next week for part two. Take care. Thank you, Professor. Have a nice uh, weekend. Thank you very much. And same to you.